Welcome back to the Foundries Church YouTube channel. We're excited that you chose to connect. If you want to connect throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to this channel. With that being said, let's dive into the current series called Short and Sweet. All right. Hey, welcome to the Foundry. My name is Matt Kuman, and I'm excited to be here with you guys today. We've been in a series called Short and Sweet, um, kind of diving into the shortest books of the Bible and then also kind of pairing them with one of the books that we've grown up with, right? They've been some stories that we've grown up with. It's Beauty and the Beast and different stories like that. Um, and we want to make sure you understand that just because we're pairing these stories that we heard growing up with the Bible, it doesn't mean that those are gospel, right? Those, those aren't the truth, but they're great uh, morals to them, and they have a really good meaning behind some of them. So we're going to be diving into some of those today. Uh, we're going to be looking at 2 John uh, specifically today, and it's going to be talking primarily about false teachers and what to do about those. Um, and I personally have had a lot of false teachers in my life, specifically um, over this past month. I've had a lot of people say, uh, you should participate in No Shave November. Um, and as you can see, that hasn't been going well. Or you can't see that. Maybe it's, <laughs> wow, it's been two weeks. I'm really trying. So, <laughs> uh, so we're going to be going into Second John. And it, in order to know this full story, it's more helpful to get some of the context around the history of Second John. Um, a few weeks ago, in this same series, we did 1 John, um, and that talked a little bit about false teachers and that kind of thing as well. Uh, but we're dealing with the same author. So John, the apostle, who was also one of Jesus' disciples, is this same author. And this book was probably or most likely written in between 85 and 95 A.D., so if you think about that, it's probably 50 to 60 years after Jesus had been killed, after he died on the cross for our sins. So you can imagine that the gospel is slowly starting to go from village to village and city to city with the good news of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. So that's the word that's starting to go out. And much like today, uh, they had missionaries, um, and they would send them into kind of that unknown world, the, the cities that are neighboring and further and further out. And what we see is in these early days, the missionaries would not have a place that they would call their own. They wouldn't have a place that's their home. So they would rely on people around them and people that they'd go into their city to provide shelter for them, to provide food, um, and then provide enough provisions to get on to the next place after they had kind of explained the gospel to the people in that specific city. So they would rely on all of those things, and that's how the gospel was spreading in the very early church. Now, uh, the problem was there was also a different group of people who were doing the same thing, but for a different reason. Um, they were going around spreading, sen, er, kind of talking about false truths about Jesus. They, they believed that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, that he didn't die for our sins, that he was just a normal man. And these people were called Gnostics. Um, and if you want to pronounce it like it's actually spelt, it's Gnostics, because there's a G in front of there, and if they're going to put a G in front, I'm going to say it like a G. <laughs> Uh, these Gnostics are going around and spreading lies about Jesus and about Christianity. Now, what we find is that in the early church, there's a lot of people who don't, you, you can imagine that they, they just don't know enough about Jesus to know who's telling the truth and who's telling lies about Jesus. How do they know how to, who to welcome into their home and who to say, nope, that, that's not welcome here? Right, So that is what the people of 2 John are kind of dealing with, and that's, the, that's why this book is written. So we're going to dive right into that, um, right at this letter. So we're going to actually read this whole letter to this group of people from 2 John. It's only a few verses, so uh, stick with me as we read it. Uh, coming out of 2 John, uh, verse 1. The elder to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. 
grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have heard from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, this, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers, who we just talked about are going from village to village, many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. See, it's not hard to put yourself in a story like this. Or it's not hard because we, how often are asking the questions, what's, what's the truth? Like, is this person telling the truth? Do they, do they actually mean what they say? Are they trying to get some false motive around some of these things? How, how do I know who to listen to? Both sides may have a really good argument. How do I know which side to go with? What, what, what do I do with those things? Let me introduce you to a story about a man who struggled deciding who was a deceiver and who was telling the truth. And this man is actually an emperor. Maybe some of you have heard this story before. But this is an emperor who loved the finest clothing possible. He loved trying things on and parading himself around his city with the finest of wares and the best colors out there. One day, two swindlers came into town, um, and they claimed that they had the finest clothing possible that they could make. They, they brought their bodice out in front of them. Yeah, aren't you impressed that I know that word? They, they, brought the, they brought all their stuff, all their sewing stuff, and said, we can make you the finest article of clothing that you have ever seen. And that caught the emperor's attention. He said, what, 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 what makes it the finest? What, what's so special about this? Well, this piece of clothing is invisible to anyone who's dumb. And he's like, oh, I've, I've never heard of anything like that before. And the emperor started thinking, well, if I had clothing like that, I would know who the smartest people around me were. I could, I could know who I should have on my advisor board, and I could know who to talk to and who to, who to converse with because I know who's smart around me. Right? He's like, I want that. Make me that, whatever it takes. So the emperor actually handed him just tons of money to start making the beautiful clothing. Right? And the swindlers go to work. They start sewing back and forth. And they start measuring things. And uh, the emperor starts to think, I wonder how it's going. But he doesn't want to ruin the surprise. He doesn't want to go down and see something half done. So he takes one of his most trusted advisors, someone who is just brilliant. Of course, he would be able to see the invisible cloth. And he told him, it's invisible to people that are dumb around us. But me and you will be able to see it and we'll be able to know who is smart in our kingdom. So this advisor goes down to where these men are working, and as he opens the door, he looks in and sees them sewing on what appears to be nothing. They don't have any, they've got needles, but there's no thread, and there's nothing on the mannequin. And he thinks, well, am I dumb? I, am I not intelligent? Am I incompetent? Like, what if, what if the emperor finds out that I'm not suitable for the job if I can't even see this piece of clothing. And as he's standing there, the swindlers are working and notice he's there and say, oh, come over here, check out the fine wares that we have. Do you see the beautiful color? And the advisor says, oh, yeah, absolutely. There is such fine color in that. I love what you did with the trousers and the length, yada, yada, yada. Right? He's so fascinated with how they've done it. And he puts on the show. 
And he goes back to the emperor and says, it is the most beautiful thing I've ever laid my eyes on. You are going to love it. But they need more money. So the emperor gives them more money to keep more gold and more fine linens. And those guys just push it off to the side. There's a parade coming a few days after that. And the swindlers promise to have this clothing piece done by the time that parade comes. And as the parade draws near, the day comes and the swindlers give note to the emperor, we have got it done, come down when you're ready. So the emperor comes down and as he walks in, the swindlers start talking about how magnificent it is again, but he doesn't see anything. Right? He doesn't see anything on the mannequin that they have. There's nothing there, but he's the emperor. He can't let people know that he's not smart or that he's dumb. So he goes along with it too. As they take it off, as they take it off the bodice and put it on him, they say, it's, it's as light as a feather. You'll barely even notice that it's on. And yeah, of course, he, do, he, he doesn't notice anything. He's like, well, maybe this is the finest where I just can't see it, but I can't let anyone know. And everyone around him is so excited and saying how magnificent this all looks. He gets ready to go down to the parade. And as he's paraded around, everybody in the city knew what the swindlers were doing and how only the smartest people could see it. And they, didn't, they also did not want to be called dumb. So they said, oh, how beautiful this is. You, you look great. You look fantastic. And the emperor is just sitting on his throne, being walked through the parade just in his glory. And then a small child from the crowd says, I don't think the man's wearing any clothes. And then a few more murmurs come from the crowd. He's not wearing any clothes. Yeah, he isn't wearing any clothes. And the emperor has to go through the whole parade without any clothes on. In the meantime, the swindlers take all of the money they were given and all the fine wares, and they run off with it. And the emperor is stuck without anything. How do we know who false teachers are? See, this is a funny story where we can laugh at a man who forgot and didn't end up having any clothes for a parade. Right? I was talking to my wife, Jolyn, about how can I make this, this message memorable for people? And I thought, what if I wear what the emperor wore on the parade? Would that make it memorable? She's like, that's a good way to lose your job. <laughs> okay, we'll stick with a different plan then. <laughs> but how do we know who false teachers are? See, we, we don't have any deceivers around us today, right? That's not actually a thing. Yeah, we, we actually do. And sometimes they show up in places where we don't actually expect for them to show up. Some years back, I had someone come into my life who was really smart. He was a brilliant man. Um, he knew the right things to say. He was very intellectual. Um, and he wasn't my boss, but he was kind of high up in the church leadership that I worked at. And after a while, he became my mentor. He was very smart, so I tried to stay really close with him and learn all the things that he was teaching. Um, and after a few years... I noticed that some of the values he was pushing on me were against what I was taught from a very young child. Right? Some of these values he was pushing on me were not the way I was reading the Bible. It didn't make sense with what I was reading, but, but this man's pretty smart. Right? He's super intellectual. How, and is my theology just off? Am I reading the Bible wrong? I, I s literally started second-guessing all of the things that I had learned growing up because this man had a great way with words. See, his intelligence made me question the truth. How do we know who the false teachers are? Because it's so easy to be deceived, even in places where we think that we're in a safe spot. See, it's even to the extent where we could be driving to work and listening to a podcast or the radio of somebody who's not a Christian, but they speak really clearly and really well. And after a while, we take heart those things that they're saying and think that those things are truth, right? Because they speak things really well. Or maybe it's a book or a mentor who's really smart at business or leadership 
or finances or parenting, and you start listening to everything they have to say. And first off, you say, I'm just listening to their parenting advice, or I'm just listening to their business advice. Even though they're not a Christian, I'm not going to listen to the things they disagree with. I'm just listening to that. But then after a while, do their values start getting into our own lives? See, do you remember what John said about deceivers? Let's jump back to verse 7. John says this. I say this. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone into the world. So hang on. John says, I say this. So that must mean whatever comes before that is our answer to the deceiver problem, right? Let's read verse 6. It says, as you have heard from, begin- from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. See, what makes us vulnerable to false teachers, what makes us vulnerable to the things of this world that are pushing us in a different direction than where our values are at, is when we're not walking in love. Or another way to say it is when you're not walking in Christ, because Christ is love. See, when you're not walking in love, you're walking in pride, in self-confidence, and having an attitude of the emperor that I just want to make myself look better in front of everyone. You see, these things encourage us to fit into society that, you know, people will think better of me if I just do this, and even if it isn't the value that I have. John says, walk in love, obey the Father, otherwise we revert back to the self-centered outlook on life. So how do we know what to look for? Right, that's the question. How do we know what to actually look for? See, I found it really fascinating. A few years ago, we bought uh, my wife a Chevy Equinox, um, a gray one. And I did not realize until we had bought that how many gray Chevy Equinoxes there are on the road. And after she bought it, we were, I was driving along, coming home from something, and a gray Chevy Equinox is going, uh, going past me, so I like honk the horn and wave, thinking it's my wife, Jalen, and it's an old lady just, oh, why are you waving at me? Right? It's like, oh, I just assumed that there's just the one, or I just assumed that there weren't that many out there. Right? When you start looking for a specific thing, You actually see it all over the place. See, if we look at what John says in in verse 5, it says this, And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have heard from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. See, John is literally saying how we're supposed to live fully in love so that we can avoid the false teachers. See, the same writer, so John, also has a gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's one of the gospels where he followed Jesus around and wrote down a lot of those things. And in that gospel, he says this, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. The sheep are going to know the voice of the master. See, study the Bible like a story. How many of us, when we're asked what our favorite story is growing up, can pretty much quote it word for word, or favorite movie, right? We know the plot. We know the motive around some characters. We know all the characters and could say some of their lines. We could say what the climax is, where everything is resolved, right? And we get excited about it. We get so much energy around telling our favorite story. What if we had that same momentum and same same exciting posture for the Bible? Right? What if, listen to this, the sheep are going to know the voice of the master. Know the Bible and know what Jesus says. Right? We are not, we're not susceptible to false teachers when we know who a false teacher isn't. That's where our struggle is is if we don't know who a false teacher is, we don't know who to listen to. But if we know the voice of the shepherd, we know who a false teacher is right away. We know what to look for. We know who to spot. And then it makes it so easy. You see, we we have a culture right now that is just thriving on self-awareness, 
right? Whatever makes you feel good, do it. YOLO, right? Uh, any of you heard that one? YOLO, before they go do something really stupid. See, we live in a culture where it's so sensitive to, if it makes me feel good, that's, that's what I'm going to do and that's what I should be pushing. And if you're surrounding yourself with people who are pushing self-appreciation and, and the self-awareness, that's, that's the false teacher. If they're not pushing Christ-awareness, that's where our issue is. Shouldn't we be focusing on Christ-awareness as opposed to self? See, a false teacher will lead you to a behavior that will lead you to breaking relationship with God. A few weeks ago, when we talked about 1 John, we talked about this too. Breaking relationship with God. So if you see, if you have a, a teacher that says something and you can see down the road that that decision is going to break relationship with God, that's where the issue is, right? A teacher of the gospel leads you to a better relationship with God. You know if a person is a good teacher in your life, if you can see the trajectory down the road that I'm going to be a better Christian if I follow this person. See, here's a question I've been wrestling with, though. You see, when we read 2 John and we compare it to some other things, there's some red flags that I read. You see, and uh, what do we do with false teachers? Right, what do we do with them? Because Second John is pretty clear. It says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. Right? I feel like we've been preaching over the last few series on love, and that doesn't sound very loving. Right? It doesn't sound like you're not allowed to welcome them into your home. You're not allowed to do anything. Just push them out. That, that contradicts a little bit what we've been doing. Because Romans 15 says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So that definitely contradicts each other. Right, if you think about the time period that we're in with this group of people that Second John is writing to, remember in the beginning we talked about how missionaries would go from town to town. Right, they would be uh, they'd go into a house and they would be provided for with food and shelter and they'd be given provisions to go on to the next place after they'd been spreading the gospel. Now what John is explaining when he says, do not welcome them into your home, he is teaching to a crowd that when they welcome into your home, they give food, they give shelter, and they give a ton of resources to go on to the next space. Right? What Second John is saying is if you find a false teacher, do not pay their salary. Right? You are literally pushing the false gospel further and further if you let them into your home. It doesn't mean that you can't love them. Right? That's, that's where the tension is. Love others around you, but don't support the ways of the wicked. See, I want to I end with this. I want to end with these few words. See, the sheep are going to know the voice of the master. Right? What does it look like for you to dive into the Word of God? What does it look like for you to take up the devotions that we have on your way out and understand who Jesus is? Right? If, we, if we're in the Word, if we're reading through the Gospels, we know the actions of Jesus. We know what Jesus would say. And if we know those things, the sheep are going to know the voice of the shepherd and they're going to run away from the voice of the stranger. We can become those people if we know the words of Jesus. If you know the master, you know the things he would say and what he wouldn't say. I want to leave you with this final thing. And this is from what we just read. I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have heard from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. You see, that's, that's the theme of this whole story. And it's not just the story of 2 John or the New Testament. It's the story of the whole Bible. Right? That's the story we, we've been reading and that we'll always dive in. Love seems to be always the answer. So what does it look like with false teachers to not let them come into our lives, still love them, but not support them in a way where we're, we're supporting their salaries, where we're giving them a foot up to get to the next level? What does it look like for us to be Christ-like and make sure that we know who may be trying to deceive us 
and who's telling the truth and who we should be spending more time with. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the words that you gave to John uh, to write to this specific church. And I ask that as we think about uh, the ways of a false teacher and the ways of a true gospel um, preacher, that you tell us and you help us see what those differences are. And we know that love is the theme through everything. And we ask that as this week, you're able to help us pinpoint some of the false teachers in our life and figure out what is the next step to do with those things. Be with us in all that we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you would like to prepare for next week's message, please click on the link below to get to our devotions. Now, devotions are an important part of the weekly rhythm at the Foundry Church. We hope that God spoke to you through this message, and we also hope that you join us again next week, because it's going to be great.